let me pray for us and uh, we'll get in the word. Jesus, we just uh, thank you that you have given us your word. Thank you for your truth. And we pray that your truth would uh, go deep in our hearts, that you would lead us and guide us and direct us into your truth, into your presence, and into who you are. And we invite you to be the one who leads us, who guides us. You're our everything. You're our God that we look to, we worship, we surrender to, and we say you are all. Uh, guide us in these moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, um, kind of want to do a slight continuation of, of last week. Um, as I as I do that, let me give one more uh, kind of uh, announcement is this, is that, you know, I recognize that when, when Melissa and I left, obviously uh, several things transpired within our, our country, and there's all the, the racial, uh, ethnic um, circumstances that are, are arising. I don't think those are new. Um, it's, it's a flashpoint of, a, a national sin that's deep rooted that's been going on a long time and, and I'll, I'll honestly say i don't think it's necessarily even a national sin i think it's a worldwide sin there's a national component to it for sure um but but this is an issue that's been uh, thousands of years and within our own country's history we have uh, very specific things um within our own country of how our country has participated in, in some of that sin um i will be addressing it specifically um in, in a couple weeks um, the messages that I'm, I'm giving right now are uh, groundwork. So they um, are intended not only to meet us where we are, maybe in, in our own lives that are unrelated uh, to that particular issue, but they're also groundwork for where we're headed to begin to have some of those very specific conversations. So in, in a couple of weeks, um, we'll, we'll be beginning to address that issue as a specific issue and uh, view some of these messages as also precursors to that and that there's principles and there's building block blocks that are being laid for some of that discussion. And um, as we think about that, um, these messages will apply yeah, universally to, to other things in our lives. And then we'll, we'll specifically get to that. Um, I've also got a path that the Lord's put on my heart to, to take us through that. And in that path, um, I've asked a couple people to give me some things that will help uh, with that path. So I've asked some people to prepare some stuff for me. Um, and uh, in doing that, we'll, we'll be ready for that path as some people are helping with some stuff really um, in, in two weeks. So uh, just know that that's coming and, and know that, that these messages, both last week and even this week, is in some ways um, precursors uh, to, to some of those discussion points. Uh, Today, though, I want us to turn back to a passage that we um, are looking at in the last week and, and even around post. So I invite you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and uh, we'll, we'll begin to see what, what God might be saying to us this week. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. While you're turning there, I want to remind us a little bit about last week. Um, last week, we, we kind of focused on, we looked at this passage a little bit, and then we dived into, or used it as a launching pad into Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Uh, Jesus has an invitation for all of us uh, to come to him, and it's an invitation of rest. But that invitation isn't simply for rest. Um, that rest comes uh, when we take a second part of that invitation. That invitation is this, take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. And, and Jesus is saying, like, I, I want to lead you. I want to guide you. I want to direct you. And I want to carry your burdens. I, I don't want you carrying these things yourself. So Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. How will I give you rest? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus is saying that, uh, really, take this yoke upon you and learn from me. It's It's instructional. And uh, we've pointed out this many times, when Jesus is, is doing this, he's, he's talking about a training yoke. He's, he's looking around as he's probably teaching this in, in, in an agricultural society. Uh, a training yoke is a very common uh, picture of the day. You would see um, when a farmer is uh, training an oxen, he would take a training yoke and the, the yoke would have uh, two holes in it, but one for the head of, of two oxen and um, one oxen over here would be 
uh, have its head in and be cranked down heavy and it would be for the one who was older, mature and knew what was going on. And the other other holes for, for the axon that's being trained, so the younger one doesn't know what he's doing. And so it wouldn't be cranked down, but it was just enough to kind of hold, hold the head in. And then in this scenario, the farmer would be teaching and, and the older oxen would be teaching, what does the farmer mean when the farmer says this? What does the farmer mean when, when the farmer gives this instruction? And so basically the older ox is carrying the full weight and the older ox is saying, okay, when the farmer says this, we, we go left. When the farmer says this, we stop. When the farmer says this, we rest. When the farmer says this, we go faster. When the farmer says this, we go right. And what Jesus is saying is, hey, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And he's also really saying is he wants to lead us and he wants to uh, be doing all the work. We're, we're tied with him. And what I, I tried to um, encourage us in is something I felt like the Lord was even showing me is that, you know, yokes lead us. That's what they do. And uh, in this scenario that Jesus is talking about, take, take your my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus said, I want to lead you. Some of us, if not all of us, and, and I found in my own life that I had some yokes on that weren't really the Lord. They were yokes that other people put on me or they were yokes I put upon myself or they're yokes of expectation I put on myself or, or, or different things. And uh, if you missed that message, it's online. It's on our website. It is on Realm. It is also on our YouTube channel. Go check it out. Um, but really what happens is yokes lead us. And if we have yokes on that are not the Lord, then we're being led in a wrong direction. Or we're, we're having weight put upon us that we're not supposed to. We have burdens we're not supposed to be carrying. And so I want to encourage you, if you missed that message, go check it out. It's on Realm. It's on uh, our YouTube channel. It's on our website. And um, begin to let the Lord show you uh, if there's any yokes that you have on that are not him. And really to uh, find a way to begin to take yokes off that, that aren't really uh, from him. And also to put the yoke on that really is him. Because he says, your rest, my rest, comes when we're learning from him and, and when we are in tandem with him. And the invitation isn't to go do things for the Lord. Uh, the invitation is to... Uh, go with the Lord and, and we're in tandem with him. So that's kind of just a recap. Our passage again today is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I invite you again to turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to start to read in verse 7. And uh, we're going to un unpack this a little bit more than we already have. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 7. We read this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Uh, this is a passage we're going to dive in a little bit more this week. And Jesus says this, but we have this treasure uh, we have this treasure in jars of clay uh, to show this all surpassing power is from God. And um, then he goes on and says, look, we are hard pressed. Uh, let me get specific. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. It's basically saying, look, I, I feel pressure on every side. I'm confused and perplexed. I I'm not sure what to do. Um, I'm persecuted and people are coming against me, but I don't feel abandoned. I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. And, and the thing is that uh, last we kind of pointed out, like Paul is saying he and his companions feel this way. And I, I think that we have pressures all around us. We have stresses all around us right now. And in those, we can be feeling some of the same things. We can feel hard pressed. We can feel perplexed. We can feel confused. We can feel um, persecuted. We could feel, um, you know, um, struck down. We feel all those things. I and mean, just the circumstances of our life can make us feel that way. And Paul says this, verse 7, that we want to draw our attention to, and this is what I want us to really kind of focus in on. He says this about himself. We have this treasure. We have this treasure in jars of clay. 
And so what we, we see here in this passage is Paul is talking about himself in, in two things he's trying to draw attention uh, to about himself. First thing is this, he's describing himself as a jar of clay. That's how he's describing himself. He's basically saying a, a jar of clay is an earthen vessel. Some of your translations may say earthen vessel. Um, that this jar, he's describing himself as saying, I'm, I'm, I'm this jar of clay. So really, when you, when you think about it as being a jar of clay, it's not something that is extravagant. It's not something that's uh, necessarily on display. He's basically saying, uh, I am a jar of, of clay, and that's what I am. He's, he's not drawing attention to himself. He's not drawing um, attention and saying, look at how great I am. He's rather saying, uh, he's trying to bring himself down to a level that maybe these people are like people may be putting Paul on a pedestal and he says, look, I, I'm a jar of clay. And in this jar of clay, I, I'm hard pressed. I'm perplexed. I'm persecuted. Um, I'm, I'm struck down. I'm all those things. I'm a jar of clay. But in this jar of clay, there is something that is unbelievable. And he says, we have this treasure in this jar of clay. And what Paul is trying to drive home is it's not me that um, you need to be um, thinking is amazing. And you may be seeing me uh, experiencing being hard pressed. You may experience me being confused. You may experience me uh, being persecuted and you may experience me being you know, all this. And you may be wondering, how is it in that environment that I have hope? How is it in that environment that I don't feel abandoned? How is it in that environment that I um, am not in despair? How is it in that environment that I'm not destroyed? It's because of this treasure. And if you're wondering why I'm not, it's this treasure. And it's this treasure of this relationship that I have with God. It's this relationship that Jesus has given me. It is this, um, uh, this treasure is, is that relationship. And so what you see coming out of me, my hope, my lack of despair, my lack of feeling abandoned is that relationship. And so all of the things that you see in that is you see him, not me. You see him. Now, the other thing I want to point out is um, found also in verse seven is uh, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show something. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show something. And so what Paul was trying to say is that my frail body, uh, my, my um, weakness as, as a human, it's got this treasure in it and it's to show something. It's to make something be visible. The question is, what is it supposed to make visible? It's a very important question for us. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all surpassing power is from God. And so what he's trying to say is that um, the different pressures that Paul's experiencing, the different hardships, the places where he's saying that he's hard pressed on every side, where he's um, persecuted, all these different things, it's to show something is to show God's power versus Paul's power. It's to show God's power working through him instead of Paul's power overcoming. And I think sometimes what happens when we're under stress and sometimes what happens when we're under pressure, I think sometimes when we're under a, a place where um, we are experiencing all these things, there's one of two things that can be displayed. Our power or God's. And I want to propose uh, to each of us that the different stresses that we're experiencing, the different um, uh, areas that we're in, that God is allowing these different stresses in different categories. And, and it can be like, I've lost a job. Um, I don't know where my next, my next job will come from. I've got six weeks until I don't have a job. But I need something in six weeks. It could be a stress of, you know, I'm lonely because I'm not interacting with people. It could be a stress of I'm stuck in a, in a small environment with the same people all the time and, and there's frustrations with that. I mean, there, there's lots of different stresses that are present within the coronavirus season. And then you throw on, on top of that, all of the, the racial issues on top of that. And you've got different stresses that come with that. Perplexion about, I don't know what to do with that. I'm not sure how to respond to that. I'm not sure what culpability I have. I, I'm not sure um, how to uh, navigate these waters. And when we're hard pressed, the question always is, what power 
will we rely on? Our own or the Lord's? And why Paul can say, on one hand, listen to this, this is the negative side. This is the things he's experiencing. He is hard-pressed on every side. He's perplexed. He is persecuted. And he is struck down. Now listen to the but statements. He's not crushed, but he's not in despair. He's not abandoned, and he's not destroyed. How does he say all that? How does he get through these hard things that he's going through like that? Because he says, it's God's power, not mine. If we are relying on our power, we'll be crushed. If we're relying on our power, we will feel abandoned. If we're relying on our power, um, we will be in despair. But, but God wants something to, to show in us is that he wants his power to be coming through us. And the purpose of it is so that God's power and God himself can be revealed to others. And so sometimes circumstances come to those that follow the Lord and you can even be in a place where you have the right yoke on. You can say, hey, I've come to Jesus. I have taken the yoke upon me. I am learning from him. And in doing that, we sometimes have the expectation, well, hardship won't come. I thought he said I have rest. No, what he's saying is, I will carry the burden with you. I want to be in this with you. And what happens is that just begins to display God's power. And so, again, just remember, verse 7 says, we have this treasure in jars of clay so this all-surpassing power from god it's from him and not from us so i, I want to ask this question before we go any further and it's a rhetorical question in the different stresses that we're in what power are you relying on in the different stresses that we're in what power is being revealed in the different stresses that we're in what um is it God that's being revealed, or is it our flesh that's being revealed? What's being revealed? That's the question. If we skip down to verse 10, it says, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. He's really just saying is, well, we experience all these hard things so that the life that God has can be revealed. If we are always being given over to death, verse 11 says, for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. And really, he's just saying that these different things happen for a purpose, and the purpose is to reveal God, not us. And what I want to spend the remainder of our time talking about is how, how does that begin to happen? How is it that um, what is revealed in us under these stresses is not our power, not our wisdom, not worldly wisdom, but the Lord. Well, where is it in our lives and how is it that we begin to engage the Lord in such a way that is his power that is on display for his glory, for, for um, people to see him and, and, and not, not us? You know, in 2 Corinthians 4, he kind of gives us um, an idea a little bit. We skip down to verse 16. In verse 16, he tells us this, and we begin to get an idea of how this might happen. It says, therefore, verse 16, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. A couple of things that I think he is trying to drive home here is one, um, how, how is it that we begin to operate on God's power, not our own? Is that we are renewed day by day. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. I mean, we have to continually, uh, constantly stay in the presence of the Lord. And when we are struck down or when different things happen, our, our sanctuary is him. And we have to go sit in him. We have to go sit in his presence. We have to allow him to meet us in that place. And as we do, well, there will be a renewing that comes from him. If we look for our renewal to come from circumstances, me, what I mean by that is if we're looking for our renewal to be our circumstances changed, now I feel better. That's not God's power. 
God's power comes not from circumstances changing. God's power is found in the middle of the circumstance not changing and being in the middle of it and saying, God, I'm coming to you. And what it also means is very often circumstances uh, will change, but they won't change sometimes quickly. And we have to come to them to be renewed daily and say, renew me, refresh me, restore me, give me wisdom anew today. And I, I need to go meet him in my day. Uh, being renewed day by day means casting anxieties to him and saying, hey, these are the things I'm worried about today. Cast them to him, put them in his lap. Uh, being renewed day by day means seeking his face intentionally and saying, I'm not going to let the day happen to me. I'm going to happen to my day. Or said differently, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to the Lord and I'm specifically intentionally deciding to spend time with Jesus because it's the only thing I've got. That's where you'll be renewed and that's where his power will come from is, is that renewal. It's praying without ceasing and saying, um, not only am I going to intentionally come, not only am I going to intentionally set time aside to specifically focus on, as I go throughout my day, I'm going to intentionally look for his presence and I'm going to intentionally pray throughout the day saying, okay, God, this just happened. I need you. Where are you? Or God, I'm not trying to respond to this. What do I do? God, I, I need help with this. They're coming against me. God, I need help with this. The, the stress is present. Like having the regular conversation, that's where renewal comes from. The renewal comes from not just the intentional uh, time you might pick, but also the intentionality throughout the day and the intentionality of recognizing God's presence. Th this power is not a self power. It comes from him. And if it's coming from him, it's coming by being yoked with him. Now, the thing is that uh, by and large, when we think about being intentional with the Lord, we often in Christian circles will talk about a quiet time. So that intentional time is kind of referring to that intentional time like, hey, I'm going to spend 30 minutes at the beginning of my day or I'm going to spend 30 minutes here. We, we carve out time, right? There's intentionality in it. But I want to I want to say that that is helpful. I think it's important. I think it's crucial. But we have to look back at that Matthew 11 passage where it says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me. Hey, that yoke of being yoked with the Lord isn't about 30 minutes or an hour, whatever your quiet time is. That yoke is I am with you in every moment, in every burden, in every circumstance, in everything. And we're in this together. And if we're praying without ceasing, what we're really doing is recognizing, Jesus, you're here in this with me right now. What do you say? I'm feeling this right now. Can I talk to you about it? It's recognizing that he is always present and always, always there. It is when Jesus says, come and learn from me, he's not saying come and find 30 minutes a day. He's saying, come and recognize my presence throughout all of it. We're yoked with him. It's not a yoke we come and put on for a little bit uh, at the beginning of each day and then take off and go about our day. It's a yoke that we come and say, Jesus, you are leading me through all of life in every moment, in every circumstance, in, in every regard. And we yoke to him. Being renewed day by day comes with that, that prayer. It comes with worship. It comes that worship becoming a regular style of how, how we live our lives and finding ways to worship the Lord in the midst of things. You know, I, I think back to Paul and Peter at different times that like they're in prison at different times and they're found in the book of Acts praising God in the midst of it. Being renewed day by day comes in that time of worship. Uh, being renewed day by day comes from uh, this you know, yoke also. And it's, it's an idea that we don't often talk about, but it's surrender. This idea of surrender. And uh, you, here, here's how you know if you are in a yoke with Jesus and you are surrendered uh, to the Lord and to his leading. You know your surrender to God when you rely on God to work things out. You know your surrender. I'll say it again. You know your surrender to God when you rely on God to work things out instead of trying to manipulate others or force your agenda or control a situation. Here's a, a way we know if we're in the yoke of the Lord and we're being led by him. If we can surrender to him and say, look, you're the one leading. I'm not. You're the one who's uh, determining how fast things go. I'm not. You're, you're the one who's plowing the ground. I'm not. I'm just here. I'm here with you. You invite me into this with you. We're in this together, but I'm surrendered to you. And with that, again, you know you're surrendered to God when you rely on God to work things out. 
in the different stresses, in the different circumstances, here's how you know. Are you relying on God to work things out? Or, or do you find yourself, or do I find myself trying to manipulate others, enforcing my agenda, or controlling a situation? It's how, one of the ways that you find out, um, are, are you surrendered? But in that surrendering, I, I want to propose that in that surrendering, there's renewal. In that surrendering, there's a, a an aspect of the burdens that we carry that are, are taken off. Because oftentimes, when Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary, have a burden, I will give you rest. The burdens come sometimes because we're really not surrendered to him. We're really surrendered to our own agenda, and we want to tie Jesus into our agenda. And sometimes what happens is we'll take Jesus on, we'll take his yoke on, and we'll say, Jesus, we're going this way. And Jesus is saying, no, we're really going this way. We want to be people who are surrendering and saying, Jesus, you're the one who's leading, and I'm, I'm surrendering to you. Uh, we have to be careful about saying, okay, Jesus, I'm glad you're here. Here's where we're going. We have to watch out for that. You know, Jesus, or not Jesus, in the scriptures, when you look at the Old Testament, it describes this about the Israelites. It's, it's an interesting phrase you'll see. It, and I'm sure it appears in the New Testament. Uh, this is just a thought that's coming to my mind right now. Um, describes Israelites many times this way. Um, they're described as a stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked. What does that mean? Is that they're set on going their own way away from the Lord, and they're stiff-necked, like, this is the way I'm going. They, they can't be led by the Lord because they're stiff-necked in the way that they want to go. And he often used that to describe that they were stiff-necked in, in their desire for sin and desire to going ways uh, away from the Lord. Uh, we have to be careful saying, um, I want to be yoked to the Lord. I don't want to be surrendered to him. I don't want to be stiff-necked. And so um, renewal comes uh, when we're surrendered because we allow him to carry the burden and we follow him. When we think about how is it that we rely on the Lord's power, um, there's a couple other things that I want to draw attention to. And I invite you now to turn with me to Matthew 14. Matthew chapter 14. We're going to look at uh, a couple different passages about what it would look like potentially um, to be renewed by the Lord and uh, what it would look like if the power is coming from him instead of us. Matthew 14. Matthew 14, we're going to look verse 22, not 22, verse 13 and following. Uh, a story, again, I think will be very familiar. We won't spend a lot of time here because I think of our familiarity with the passage, but there's a point that I believe God has for us today in this familiar passage. Matthew 14, starting in verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw, saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Verse 15, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Uh, I just want to put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples for a second. The disciples see a need. There are 5,000 uh, people here, it says. Well, it's actually more than that because they were only counting the men. Uh, you got women and children who are not counted. So it's way more than that. But it's, it's thousands of people here. They're recognizing that Jesus is healing and, and doing things for these people that are really good. And they're also recognizing, like, these people need to eat. And, and they're not going to leave because all these other things happen. You, you got to do something. And so Jesus' answer, though, is really important. And I think it's an important, important uh, answer for us. Jesus' answer in verse 16 says, they don't need to go away. They don't need to go away. You want them to go away. You want them to get out of here, and I'm doing a good thing for them. You don't need to send them away. Instead, you need to give them something to eat. If you're a disciple, and now you have just been told by Jesus, I have to feed them, how am I going to feed this many people? There's 12 of us. There's thousands of them. We're not even a catering company. How are we going to do this? They then say, here's what we have. Oh, you want us to do it? Well, here's what we have. We have 
Jesus, just so you know, we have we have five loaves of bread, we have two fish. And Jesus says, bring them to me. The point that I want to um, draw attention to is this. The disciples first had to be shown what they um, lacked. That's the first thing. They then had to recognize what they had, which they still view as not enough. To then realize that the power that they're relying on is their own. And they need to rely on Jesus' power for all these things. This is a, an illustration for the disciples about how to walk in his power instead of theirs. In their own power, they have no way to feed these thousands. In their own power, they've got five loaves and two fish. That's what they have. In God's power, they have the ability to feed thousands. And sometimes what happens is we're limited by how we respond to difficult things and heavy things because we look at the resources we have and we don't realize that God himself is the resource we have. What Jesus wants his disciples to see is the physical things you see are not your resources. I am. Bring them to, bring them to me. And so when they walk out of the situation and they have fed thousands, what's the lesson the disciples should have learned? Jesus is our power and not us. And it's for his glory, not our glory. If we, if we bring our own resources, it's for our glory. If we bring God's resources, it's for his. If we are going to be like Paul in 2 Corinthians, saying we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God, we have to be a people who believe that God has an answer for these things we have to come to him, we have to rely upon him, and we have to say, what can you do with this? This is, this is all we got, but what can you do? And, and we have to have that invitation of Jesus saying, bring it to me. And then what happens is Jesus then sent them out with the stuff, but now with his power, and they distributed it to all the people. And they got to see what it was like to do it with him instead of on their own. I, I want to propose that for us, if we're going to walk in God's power, we can't look at um, the different circumstances, the way the disciples did originally, and saying, this is all I got. I, I got nothing. We have to look at it as Jesus is always here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this to him and say, what do you want to do? And how are we going to do this? Um, we, we go to him. You know, that, that's one idea, but it's not the only one we can find like that in Scripture. If you turn to the book of Judges, so in the Old Testament, find the book of Judges, um, you'll you know, turn to Judges chapter 7. Let me turn there as well. This will be... Um, okay, the book of Judges. Um, before the book of Ruth, it's before First and Second Samuel. So if you can find First and Second Samuel, turn to your, your left, and you'll find Judges there, just like, I think a book or two later. Um, Judges chapter 7. And I want to read um, a bulk of this story to us, uh, just again to, to get a very similar point. Judges chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Judges 7, starting in verse 1. Early in the morning... Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her, announce now to the people, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men who were there as, as soldiers to uh, go into this battle, 22,000 men left. And Gideon, getting ready to go into a, a battle with a, a group of people, was now left with 10,000 people. Verse 4, And the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. 
I, I imagine what did Gideon think when when uh, God says to him, "You got too many people. I don't want you to think that this is going to be in your power. I don't want you going with an army of thirty two thousand people uh, against this other group in this battle. You got too many." What do you think Gideon felt when he watched twenty two thousand people walk away and only ten thousand are left? I'm sure at that point he's like, "How are we going to do this? I mean, that okay, that's not great, but ten thousand people, all right." And then to have God say, you still have too many. I'm, I'm sure Gideon's kind of like, what, what do you mean I have too many? Verse 4, the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you. If I say um, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. And so we're taking down the water, and the way they drink, take the ones who um, drink water in this fashion, lapping up like a dog, and separate them from the ones who uh, drink it by kneeling down um, and, and cupping it in their hand. That, that's what you do, just separate them out. Verse 6, 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths, and the rest got down their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, with 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give you the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. Gideon started with 32,000 men. God says you got too many. If you go in like that, you're going to think it's you. If you go in that, it'll be about your glory and your army. You got too many men. And so he sifted them with a question, 22,000 left. Then he sifted them further and said, of these 10,000, here's how we're going to do this. Uh, take them down, and, and depending on how they drink, we're going to sift them. 300 drink uh, water in a certain way, and God says, that's what I want. And do you know God sent Gideon out with 300 men against um, an, a large army in a battle. And then God was victorious with Gideon and those 300 men. Because what was seen was God's power instead of Gideon's or Israelite's army. You know, sometimes what happens in our lives is God wants to show his power, not ours. I want to say that again. Not sometimes. God is always wanting to show his power and not ours. What he wants is his people to be reliant upon him. What he wants is his people to be surrendered to him. What he wants is his people to be renewed by him. What he wants is his people to walk in tandem with him. And as we do, God overcomes tremendous things by his power and not ours. Jesus, Jesus is saying to us through Paul in, in 2 Corinthians, we have this treasure. And, and this treasure is, is the Lord. And when we're hard pressed, what is seen and what is displayed and what is revealed should be Jesus, not us. It should be Jesus' power, not ours. And what happens is, is God allows us to be in these situations so that he is revealed. And people will look at it and say, Gosh, I need I, I need that in my life. Now, I, the thing I want to propose when we, we go back to that Second Corinthians idea is he says we have these jars in earthen vessels or, or jars of clay. And basically, what Paul is saying is like I'm just like everybody else. The only difference about me versus other people is I have this treasure in this jar. There are other people out there who are a jar just like me, but they don't have the treasure. So when they are hard pressed, you don't see God's power coming out. What, what they see is a great need. And what happens is when they see me, just like them, they see something different come out and they say, I need that treasure. Could it be that the stresses that we're experiencing are so that other people can see God's power revealed through us so that other people who do not have the treasure we have can look and say, I want, I need that treasure for me. How do I get it? See, these things happen so God's power and the treasure of a relationship with God can be made visible. So others would say, I want what you have. I want what you have. But they won't see the treasure if we walk in our own power. They'll see us and they won't see him. If we're not being renewed daily, they won't see us. I mean, they won't see him, they'll see us. If we're renewed daily, they'll, they'll see him. And Paul is saying, I'm on display. I'm on display for everyone to see this treasure 
I'm on display for everyone to see that this power that I have to respond to these different circumstances is coming from him. How, how do you do that? How do you even get up in the morning? Jesus. It's, it's in that relationship. You know, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, it says this. Joshua is going to go take the Israelites into the promised land, and they have many um, things ahead of them in order to take that promised land. And Joshua is told this by God in chapter 1, verse 9. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We have to ask this question. Do we have the expectation? Do we have the understanding? Do we have the propensity to be looking for God in all these moments? Because I have the expectation God's present. If I have the understanding that God's present, and if I have that expectation, now I'll be looking for him. If I can see him in these moments, then how he's leading will be what comes out. And the power that will be displayed is his and not mine. In order for God to be revealed in us, this is really important. In order for God to be revealed in us, we have to have him revealed to us. Let me say that again. In order for God to be revealed in us, we have to first have him revealed to us. And sometimes, often, these circumstances of feeling hard-pressed or um, persecuted or um, perplexed and confused um, or struck down, often these different circumstances and stresses that a lot of us are currently experiencing is really for God to become revealed um, to us so it can then be revealed through us. And if we want um, for him to be revealed to us first, it means our fears, we cast our anxieties to him. It means our pain, we carry it to him. It, it means our dismay and our confusion. We, we acknowledge him and say, what do I do with this? If, if he's protecting us, it, then I don't need to protect myself. If, if he is comforting us, I don't need to comfort myself. If he's doing all these things. So these circumstances, these stresses are designed for God to be revealed to us so that God can then be revealed through us. And Paul says we have this treasure in jars of clay so that God can be revealed, so this all-surpassing power of God can be revealed in us. What's being, what's being revealed? Just uh, a couple of points that I've kind of already mentioned a little bit of a recap a little bit. What we need to be surrendered to him. Uh, we don't want to be tied to other yokes. If we're tied to other yokes, they'll lead us in, in wrong ways and they, we won't see God's power. Um, we need to look for him. He's there. If you can't see him, then, then sometimes what happens is we have to walk by faith. Faith is believing things not yet seen. And so sometimes what happens is this, when, when problems happen and when circumstances get hard, uh, what happens, I, I see two things. People respond to very hard circumstances in one of two ways. And let me qualify this. Oftentimes, a lot of believers respond to problems or, or hard circumstances in one of two ways. First way is this, God's not here. Second way, God is here. Sometimes we look at our circumstances and say, God couldn't possibly have let this happen to me. He must not be here. Or you can say, okay, this is really hard. I'm glad you're here. Uh, faith is believing things not yet seen. Faith comes from connecting with the Lord. And faith isn't blindly following. Faith is trusting you know that faith is, is trusting God knows where we're going, even if I don't. Uh, faith is trusting your timing, not mine. Faith is, is saying, um, I'll, I'll wait. You know, Ann mentioned earlier in our family time that sometimes he tells us to rest. We don't like that because we think we got to go. And, and sometimes it's like, no, just rest because this is where we are right now. It takes faith to rest. It takes faith to do nothing. It takes faith to say, hey, God's doing something. It takes faith also to say, hey, we're going into this. It takes faith for getting to say, I'm going in with 300 men. It takes faith for the disciples to say, okay, we're going to walk away this basket and we're going to feed all these thousands. It takes faith. But that faith comes by being in relationship with him and saying, you're the one leading. And we're surrendered to him. 
you know, sometimes um, we can tell, like, are we uh, really connected to the Lord? We have to cast our fear to him. We have to acknowledge his presence. We have to trust his leading. And then we can walk in his power. But sometimes we, we, we can find out, like, all these stresses, are they becoming so much? Um, we have a way of finding out if we are really connected to the Lord or not. And, and here's, here's what I tell you is, is a way to find out. If we're carrying all these things ourselves and we're not tied to the Lord and we're not with him and he's not carrying our burdens and we're not in it with him, then we may find ourselves doing this. And I can find myself doing this from time to time. This is, you know, something I've learned in my own life. And this is, this is a test I've given to myself. If you're under a lot of stress, if you find yourself muttering under your breath, if you're under a lot of stress and you find yourself mumbling, but nobody can really hear, but you kind of, if you find yourself doing that, what I have found is if I find myself doing that, these are things I've not taken to him. Because I can't contain it. i got to keep it here, and it's got to come out. And so if I'm muttering under my breath, I'm not, I've learned, if I'm muttering under my breath, I'm not talking to God about that problem. I've learned that to be a cue. The things I'm muttering under my breath need to be turned into a prayer. If you find yourself stressed and you find yourself muttering under your breath, if you find yourself frustrated, if you find yourself angry, if you find yourself muttering, turn your mutter into a prayer. When I have turned my mutters into prayers, I find renewal. When I've turned my mutters into prayers, I've found um, the leading of the Lord. When I've turned my mutters into prayers, I've found the comfort of the Lord. When I've turned my mutters into prayers, I've found strength and patience to wait for the Lord to move. When I've turned my mutters into prayers, I've found the presence of Jesus. It's, it's in that place that I know I'm yoked to him. It's in that place where I'm learning from him. It's in that place where I'm saying, what are we going to do here? Turn our mutters into prayers. It's where we're saying, God, what are you doing here? God, where are we going? God, what are you saying about this? That's, that's what we do. You know, oftentimes we're confused um, because God hasn't spoken about something yet. And sometimes he just wants to see if we'll lean into him. Oftentimes uh, we're confused because he's saying, come to me. And clarity comes in the presence. But sometimes what happens is when the clarity doesn't come as quickly as we think it should, we then try to go our own way. And we need to be careful not to go our own way. We need to be careful to wait on him for um, the leading he wants to give us. And we need to ask him uh, to shepherd us in our hearts and our souls in the season. That's a, a word for um, all of us. And at the same time, reminds it's also a word um that's a building block for where we're going we begin to talk about the different um sin issues in our country in regards to um, racism we will not have an answer if we're not yoked to him we will carry a burden that is not our own if we don't um, connect ourselves to him and say how are we doing this together? We cannot solve a problem that's really since the beginning of time on our own. We could be like Gideon looking at, how am I going to go against this big army? And God's saying, you got too much. What God was saying to Gideon was, I want you to see this is me. And I want you to say there is hope. And God is in the business of restoring, of redeeming, of making things new of sanctifying, of purifying, and making people into his image. We want to do it with him. We want to do it with him. May the Lord tie us um, back into him. May, may we take upon the yoke of the Lord and may we learn from him. May, may we um, sit in his presence and say, what do you say about May, may we sit in his presence with the word of God. And it says last week, there are a lot of opinions. 
And there is a lot of wisdom that's out there about how to respond to these things. There's lots of blogs. There's lots of tweets. There's lots of um, videos. There's lots of different things. And, and we can turn to those things. We want to be learning from the Lord. Now, I will say the Lord may say, hey, watch this video. The Lord may say, hey, read this. The Lord may say, um, l- look at this, this tweet. But let the Lord lead you to the things he's, he's, he's saying to, to look at. But I will t- say this. The first thing he's saying is, look at me. Look at me. I think he's saying, be in the word. You got to know my word because it's different what the world would say. If you are not sinking into the word and, and letting the word go deep into our hearts, we will be misled. There's a, this is my last thought, and it's kind of tied to that. Um, you know, when, when they teach people to study counterfeit money, and, and they want people to be able to identify counterfeit money, it's not a new idea. It's not even a new analogy. I'm sure you probably even heard it. When, when they are trying to figure out, like, to train people, how will they identify counterfeit money? They don't show them lots of counterfeit bills and have them study all the counterfeit. What they do is they have them study the original real dollar to know everything about that. So when they see something that's off, they can recognize it. Because there's lots of different counterfeiting out there and there might be even a new way to counterfeit later. So you don't study the counterfeits, you study the real. So when you find something that's off, you know it's off. I wanna encourage us, get in the word of God. Know what's real from him, know his truth, his word, and go to him. We need to be yoked to him. We need to let him lead us. We want to learn from him. And go to the Lord. And go to the Lord with all of our stresses. Let him renew us. For we have this treasure and jars of clay that the all surpassing power of God might be displayed in us and revealed through us. May we be a people who God reveals himself to us. So what's displayed through us it is a revelation of him and his treasure. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your invitation. We want to take our yoke, your yoke upon us, and we ask you to lead us. And we want your power, not ours. If there's ways that our power has uh, been what we've been relying on, just open our eyes we'd see it. We just want to lay it down. We want to be surrendered to you. This is your problem. All these things are your problem, and you have a solution. We cast our anxieties to you. We worship you. We cry out to you. Lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, God bless you. Chris Hanger is going to come on uh, right now and hopefully be able to, to take us into a prayer time if you would want to join us. Chris, can you, can you jump on?